Thank you. I don't need that. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you again. It's great to be back here. Uh, it's always exciting for me to see what God is doing here among you. Uh, you are a great group of people who love Jesus, and, and I love seeing that. Uh, yeah, no, this is, this is okay. So I, can, I, can, I can do this. Sorry. It's all right. Uh, so it's good to be back with you. Uh, several weeks ago, when, uh, when Tosh asked me to, to speak, and she said that it was the beginning of a new series called Beyond Sunday, and what I talk about our personal lives beyond Sunday. Well, that's sort of everything. So I said, can we, can we narrow it down a bit? What's the scripture passage? Said, well, whatever you would like. <laughs> okay. Um, could you tell me what the other messages will be the rest of the series so I can narrow it down? She said, well, it's going to be beyond Sunday with your friendships and beyond Sunday with your work. And I thought that that gave me a sense of what I would be talking about until two days ago, talking with Dave Benson about it. He said, oh, if it's your work and your friendships and you have the rest of it, you need to speak to the people who have no job and have no friends. <laughs> he wanted a sermon for him. That's, that's what it's all about. Uh, so if, if that's you, I hope this will be, you know, be, be meaningful for you. If you do have a job and you do have friends, you might pick up a thing or two along the way. That'll be helpful, okay? All right, so anyway, let me, uh, let me read the scripture passage. Uh, it's a short one that I want to, to kind of uh, piggyback off of here this morning. It comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, Paul simply says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do ask that your word would be transformative, that it would shape us, that it would change us, that it would comfort us where needed, that it would challenge us where needed, but most of all, that it would point to you, that it would bring glory and honor to your name above all else. And we pray in that precious name of Jesus, amen. Do these words sound at all familiar? I woke up in a Soho doorway. A policeman knew my name. He said, you can go sleep at home tonight if you can get up and walk away. I staggered back to the underground and the breeze blew back my hair. I remember throwing punches round and preaching from my chair. I took the tube back out of town, back to the rolling pin. I felt a little like dying down with a streak of Rin Tin Tin. I stretched back and I hiccuped and I looked back on my busy day. 11 hours in the tin pan, God, there's got to be another way. I know there's a place you walked where love falls from the trees. My heart is like a broken cup. I only feel right on my knees. I spit out like a sewer hole. You, re you still receive, yet still receive your kiss. How can I measure up to anyone now after such a love as this? And then the chorus is, none of you know. You know the chorus. Who are you? Who, who, who are you? Come on, people. It's one of the biggest bands in British history. It just uh, all right, no, we're not going to sing it. All right, you're probably more familiar with it if you watched CSI. It's the theme song to CSI, okay? Who are you? It's by The Who. All right. So Pete Townsend, who wrote the song, said this about it. He said, when Roger Daltrey sang it, the psalm became a prayer from a destitute man to God. It was a man who looked at his life and the mess he made out of it. And the realization of that mess drove the man to look to the sky and ask, God, who are you? That's a pretty powerful statement about a rock song by a band that, as far as I know, really had no clue who God was. And I think there is something profound about what, what Pete Townsend heard and what he understood was going on when Roger Daltrey sang it. 
But I think there's something else that is even more significant for our purposes, because there's another way to look at those words and what's going on. That's one of the beauties of art forms. You can see different things going on. Yeah, it can be a guy who's destitute, his life is a mess, he's in despair, and he cries out to God saying, God, who are you? Are you there? How can I find you? But what if it's actually the man in his despair and with his destitute life and he's looking in the mirror and he's saying, who are you? Who have I become? What's happened to me? How did I get here? This was never the plan. This isn't who I thought I was supposed to be. He just wakes up one day, realizes the mess he's made of his life and says, who are you? It's a real question of identity. And it's a question that we all ask from time to time. Have you ever been in that place where you woke up and you wondered, how did I get here? How did I become the person that I am? And who am I? Who am I supposed to be? When it comes to living life beyond Sunday, that's the question that applies. Who are you? Who are you from Monday to Saturday? Now, if you're a follower of Christ, well, you know, the question can be even more specific. Lord, who have you made me to be? Who do you want me to be from Monday to Sunday? Because part of what we need to recognize is it's difficult to answer that question because of the culture that we are immersed in. That's part of what Paul's dealing with, that that we live in a culture that shapes us. And we often don't even recognize that that we're being shaped by that culture. Yet each and every moment of each and every day, we're living in a world that is moving us in a certain direction, trying to conform us into something. And Paul is saying, no, we need to be aware of that. And we need to figure out what's the version of ourselves that God wants us to be. And how do we do that? But the problem is we live in this culture. We're immersed in it wherever you are. It doesn't matter which side of the pond you're on. It doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is. You have a culture that has shaped you in certain ways. Because it is, as Glenn Scrivener in the book of the same title that he wrote, it's the air we breathe. It's just what you take in all the time. There's another way to think about it, uh, and and it's simply this. Think about the, the, the story. There's two young fish just kind of swimming along. And coming from the other direction is an older, wiser fish who, as he passes the two young fish, says, hey, boys, how's the water? And they don't respond at all, and they keep swimming. And finally, one of the young little fish turns to the other one and says, what's water? They have no idea. It's just the environment that they're in. They don't recognize what it is that is giving them life, what it is that they're swimming in. It is just what they have going on every day. Let me give you a personal example from my own life. So in the years prior to becoming a teenager, uh, my family lived in pretty much a blue collar working class part of town. I grew up in Pittsburgh, which is just known for steel, for heavy industry. And on my mother's side of the family, that's what everybody was engaged in. My grandfather and my uncles, they all got up every day, whatever shift they were working, they went to the mill, they put their time in, they stopped at the pub on the way home, they made their way home, and and they did that every day, that was life. And what they looked forward to was the day when they could retire. You know, they've paid their union dues, they've put their time in, they've worked hard, and retirement would come someday when they could go hunting or go fishing, spend extra time at the pub, and just relax. That was the goal of life. And that's what pretty much all of my cousins on my mother's side of my family did as they grew up. Now, what's interesting is nobody said, this is what you are supposed to do, and this is what the good life looks like, and this is what we value and love. It's just the way it was. My grandfather didn't sit down with any of my cousins. My uncles didn't sit down with any of them and say, okay, here's what you do. You go to the mill, you get a job starting doing this, and then you'll move up to this position, and then eventually that position. And you go to your union meetings, and you pay your dues, and you keep doing that until you come to retirement, and then you retire, and that's, that's the goal of life. Nobody said that's what it is. It just was. And nobody said that education doesn't matter, but that was part of the reality. 
No one in my mother's side of the family ever went to college until I did. It just wasn't talked about. It wasn't part of the air we breathed. It wasn't part of the water we swam in. Fortunately for me, my father's side of the family was a little bit different. My father grew up on a farm, not the inner city. His father was an immigrant who bought a farm, bought a, a, a butcher shop, and worked hard and did everything he could to continue to improve and increase their lifestyle. And so my father grew up in that environment, and we moved from the inner city out to the suburbs to a, a more upper middle class environment where all of a sudden, working at the mill was not even on the radar. It was about getting an education. But again, my father never sat me down and said, okay, here's the plan. Here's who we are. Here's what we value. Here's what we love. Here's what you're going to do. It was just the air we breathed because everybody else in that neighborhood was living according to the same values. And what all of that was pointing to is in all, each of those situations, this is what we value. This is what life, the good life looks like in our terms. And in essence, what it was is that became what people loved. They're loving that good life. They're looking for that life that will fulfill them and, and will give them what, what is valued in that culture. Whether it's eventual retirement and going to the pub or whether it's getting an education or whether it's moving up to the next nice neighbor, whatever it is, those were the things that drew people, that motivated people. And again, it wasn't explicit. It was implicit. It was just there shaping you. And we all experience that kind of thing every day, moment by moment every day. The culture is shaping us in different ways without explicitly teaching us. Let me give you another example that you all experience all the time. When's the last time you saw a toothpaste commercial that explained to you the chemical makeup of the toothpaste and the chemical reaction it had on your teeth and also told you the proper way to brush and how many strokes and all. No, you don't get commercials like that. What do you get? You get people with beautiful smiles who find themselves being wanted by very attractive, sexy people with other beautiful smiles. And what does it tell you? The good life can be had if you use our toothpaste. <laughs> and the good life is what? That beautiful, sexy people will desire you. Now, it doesn't say that because if it said that, what would we do? We would all laugh like, that's ridiculous. But the image is there. And subconsciously we go, oh, yes. And we're shaped we're molded by the things going on around us in the culture. What we end up doing if you're a follower of Christ is that you may be aware of that. You may be aware that there's this kind of thing going on and that you're supposed to be following Jesus and somehow your life is supposed to be different. But what we end up doing so often is we end up compartmentalizing our lives into Sunday and then Monday through Saturday, which is the reason for this series. Because we find ourselves getting out of this fishbowl in the water we swim in, and we get into the next fishbowl of Monday through Saturday, and we swim in that water, and the two never meet. And we live these bifurcated lives. We live these lives that somehow separate out. And at best, we end up trying to figure out a way to still be Christian and live in the culture, but we don't end up being very different from the culture. In fact, we take some of the same things that we've been shaped by and we Christianize them. So when it comes to living a certain way in terms of our family and what we do and what we care for, we baptize it in Christianese kind of language with ne never asking, Jesus, is this who you really want me to be? This is what I'm really supposed to be all about. So in the case of my father's value system of, of providing for your family and getting an education and moving up and living in a nice neighborhood and all of that sort of thing, it's very easy to Christianize that and say, yes, that's what God wants for me because God wants me to be blessed. And that's blessing. But what if who the Lord has you to be is somebody who's actually supposed to go the other direction and move to the inner city? and live among people who are different and in need and struggling and hurting. 
So oh, we're not so sure about that because we've been shaped by a different value system. And maybe God is calling us to something else, something different. So we need to ask the question, who am I, Lord? When I look in the mirror, who do you want me to be? Who do you want me to become? Paul is concerned about his Roman audience. People who've come to faith in Christ in the midst of a culture that is anything but Christian. And he's concerned that they've grown up in that culture and they live in that culture and the values of that culture have just been absorbed into their lives and they don't even recognize it. And they've been shaped by it. He understands that in the Roman world, it's about power, it's about control, it's about domination. And unfortunately, in the Christian world, we could take even that kind of value system and baptize it and say, oh, we'll use those things for the sake of the kingdom without ever asking, Lord, is that how you want us to be? Is that what you want us to do? My cousins... If you ask them, what is it that you love? They wouldn't say, I love the idea of going to the mill and stopping at the pub and eventually retiring. But if you observed how they lived, you would find out, no, that is really what they love. That's what they yearn for. That's what they long for. That's what gives them satisfaction. If you had asked you know, the, the people in Paul's day, the Roman citizens, oh, do you love domination and power and control? Oh, no, 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 because that just sounds you know, way too bold. But if you looked at their lives, you'd realize, no, that is what they love because that's what gives them meaning. That's what they're striving for. That's what they're trying to achieve. So how do you answer the question of who are you? Part of how you answer it is by asking, who do you love? What do you love? What do you yearn for? What, what gives you a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction? And a sense of, of being who you want to be. Paul's first verse really comes into play here when he says, don't be conformed into the thinking of the world. I love the, the way uh, one commentator, William Hendrickson, translates that verse. He says, stop allowing yourselves to be fashioned after the pattern of this evil age. Stop allowing yourself to be fashioned. That little by little, it, it sort of changes you, shifts you, molds you, adjusts you, adds this here, clips that there. And eventually you don't even realize you're not living a Christ life like life. Paul says, instead of letting the world fashion you, he says, what you need is a transformation. You need a change from the inside out. And when he talks about transformation, he uses the word that's at the root of our word metamorphosis. He's talking about a complete change of who you are in terms of your identity, in terms of what you are from the inside all the way to the outside. It's not just about being fashioned on the outside to live in a certain way, but it's about from the inside out. He says that, that the way this is going to happen, the way this transformation will take place is by a renewing of your mind. A renewing of your mind. Well, what's that mean? Well, first, what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you can educate your way to being like Jesus. Now, education is important. What you think is important. But there's so much more to who we are in terms of our mind, in terms of, of being renewed. There are people who will say, all we need is to educate people better. You need, if we have better education, if people know the right thing and know the right thing to do, then, then we will change society for the better. That doesn't seem to be working out very well. And what Paul says in Romans chapter 7 would seem to say, no, that's not the whole answer. Because in Romans 7, what does he say? Why do I do the thing I know I shouldn't do and that I don't even want to do? And why do I not do the thing I know I should do and I want to do. And he says, what is wrong with me? Like, in my head, I know what to do, but I don't do it. So it's not just education. It's not just knowledge. While that's important, but there's more to what's going on here. If we're going to be transformed into Christ likeness, there's more that has to happen than just education. There's more that has to happen than just knowing you know, Bible verses that you can recite or being able to, to recite theology that you learn. There's something else that has to happen deep down inside of us because it's not just about our mind. It's about our whole being. 
It's not just your intellect. It's not just how you process information. It's about everything that you are. I mean, how does Jesus put it when he says that, that you're to love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's a, it's a totality. It's everything that you are needs to be able to love the Lord. Well, how does that happen? How do you, how do you start with that? Let me suggest that Monday through Saturday, your personal life Monday through Saturday actually starts right here. This is critical for your Monday through Saturday. Now, there's a growing movement within Christian circles of the, oh, I don't, you know, I don't need to, to be there for church. I don't need to gather with other people. You know, I can follow Jesus just fine on my own. Now, it used to be that people who weren't following Jesus and didn't have a relationship with God used that as an excuse to not go to church, say, hey, I can connect with God anywhere. Now, they really weren't, <laughs> but saying, I don't need to go to church. It's tragic to see that more and more Christians are saying that, saying, I don't need the church. I don't need to connect with that. You know, there's too much hypocrisy there. There's, you know, it's, it, it, it's drab, it's boring, and whatever. There's all kinds of excuses and saying, I can follow Jesus just fine on my own. Not according to Jesus, you can't. We need the body together, gathered to experience who God is, to have us ready and equipped for Monday through Saturday. I, I love the, this quote from author James K.A. Smith. Uh, He wrote a book called You Are What You Love. He says this, Christian formation is a life-encompassing Monday through Saturday, week-in, week-out project, but it radiates from and is nourished by the worship life of the congregation gathered around word and table. There is no sanctification without the church, not because some building holds a superstitious magic, but because the church is the very body of Christ animated by the Spirit of God and composed of spiritual practices. This is crucial. If you're going to to follow Jesus and be who he wants you to be the rest of the week, you have to encounter God corporately in worship. When we worship together, we are called together into the presence of God. Jesus made it clear. He says this. He says, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I will be. Okay, let's think about that for a moment. Does that mean that if you somehow ended up stranded all by yourself on a desert island, that Jesus would not be there? Of course not. He's going to be there. So it can't just mean, oh, I'm there everywhere. It must mean that there is something different. There's something significant. There's something more that God does when we come together, two or three or more, he says, in his name. And I think it's this, it's not like there's more of Jesus present, but we experience him differently. Why? Because all of a sudden now, as we gather together, I experience Jesus not only in my own prayer life, but I experience Jesus as he's expressed through Simon. I experience Jesus as he's expressed through Steph. And that's, that's the sense of, okay, he really is here in a more tangible, powerful way that we need one another's experience of Jesus to increase our own experience of Jesus. So we've got to gather together. We need one another if we're going to grow in Christ. And the community has to come together so that we can together express our corporate love for the Lord. And we can experience his corporate love for us his bride, the body of Christ. When we come together in worship, it puts us in a posture where we're submitting ourselves to God, to his grace that is being poured out through ordinary means, and we can respond to that grace. And that grace gets poured out through one another, through the forgiveness we experience from one another, through the things we learn from one another, through the ways that we find ourselves having to serve one another and we experience the presence of Christ. Paul says, if you're going to be transformed, you have to do it together as the body. But there's another part of this that's significant. When he talks about being transformed, it's really interesting. He says, present yourselves, your whole body, as a living sacrifice. So he says, take action, do something. Here's the thing for you to do. But then when he says, as a result, you'll be transformed, that's in the passive voice. It's something that will be done to you. 
You present yourself available. Lord, I am here. I'm yours. As even we've already sung, I'm presenting my whole self to you, Lord. That's the action we take. And then, in a sense, we are passive in that God's grace works in us. And the Holy Spirit shapes us and moves us and does things within us that that happen without us even recognizing it. But we've made ourselves available. We've put ourselves in the right posture. So what about... Monday through Saturday, since that's what this is really all about. I want to propose that one key piece to living Monday through Saturday for Jesus is what we at our church call habits of grace. You've probably heard them referred to as spiritual disciplines. How many of you heard that phrase, spiritual disciplines? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about prayer and fasting and reading the Bible and journaling, serving others, giving generously, all that kind of stuff, okay? I don't like the phrase spiritual disciplines because I don't like discipline. <laughs> like, let's just, I like spiritual things, but the discipline part, no, not so sure. But one of the things I've noticed about how we respond to the phrase spiritual disciplines and so much of the teaching about it over the years is it becomes this thing that it's all on me and I've got to work and I've got to do this stuff to strive for, to try to achieve some level of spiritual growth that I'm making happen. And that's not what's going on when we do these things well. And it's why I like the phrase habits of grace better. Because just like when we gather together and we experience Jesus from one another, it, without even us doing something to make that happen, we just come together, we worship together, and God says, okay, I'm going to make myself known through you. That's a gift of grace. And it's the same thing with our spiritual disciplines, if they are habits of grace, things that we just do. You know, and, and your habits, when you have habits, you really don't have to work at doing those, do you? You just, you just kind of do them. You've learned to do them. Early on, you had to work to get used to it, but eventually, it's just who you are. It's just part of your being. And God works in that by making himself known in those habits of grace, by making himself known through our prayer, through our meditation, through our scripture reading, through our serving of others, through our giving. So practicing those things will begin to shape who you are and it will actually begin to shape what you love and how you love. Even if you don't feel like doing habits of grace, go ahead and do them anyway because God will begin to work through them. And this is an important thing in our culture that so values authenticity. You know, I wanna be authentic. I need to be my authentic self. And usually what that means is I just need to do only the things that I feel like and want to do and are easy for me right now. <laughs> because if it's hard for me to do, that must not be who I am. No, sorry, that's not how this works. You know, in, in Christian terms, we say, oh, I don't want to be a hypocrite. You know, I don't want to pretend, you know, that I'm doing something I'm not really, that my heart's not in, that I'm not really engaged in. You know, if, if, I have a, if God says I'm supposed to love my neighbor and I have a neighbor who is just a jerk, I mean, what, am I supposed to pretend that I love them? Like, that's just, that's fake. That's not authentic. That's hypocritical. No, you're supposed to pretend that you love them. I really mean that. And I'll take no greater authority than C.S. Lewis, who said essentially the same thing. Here's what Lewis had to say about this whole idea. He said, don't waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you do. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. If you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. There's this theory in psychology called cognitive dissonance. It basically is this, that you've got two things going on in your brain and they don't fit together. <laughs> they don't harmonize. They're, they just don't work. And let's say, for instance, you've got that neighbor that just bugs you, but you know, okay, I have to love them for Jesus, which means I need to serve them. I need to care about them. I need to tend their garden when they're away on holiday. Uh, I need to provide a meal for them when they're sick. Uh, I need to maybe even invite them over to our place for a meal. I just need to do loving things. 
What Lewis is saying is eventually you will come to love that person. Why? Early on, you're thinking, I don't like doing this. I don't like this person. But as you are serving and doing loving things, all of a sudden the dissonance in your brain is going, who am I? (laughs) What am I really thinking? What do I really believe? And you know what's easier to do at that point? Change your mind and experience the fact that, you know what? I actually do kind of love this person. I see them in a different way now. And as I've prayed for them, God has done something in my life. And as I've served them, God has done something to shape me and change my attitude towards them. I, I saw a similar thing. It's not a cognitive dissonance thing so much, but it is the impact of, of doing loving things towards someone and seeing your love increase for them. And it had to do with something I did for my wife. So she, she had a birthday that was coming up. And ladies, you'll understand if I just say it was a birthday that ended with a zero. Okay? It doesn't matter what year it is. It ends with a zero. That's traumatic. All right? So she, she had one of those birthdays coming up, and it was one of the more traumatic zero birthdays. So I learned enough in our years of marriage that I said, okay, honey, um, do you want me to just ignore this birthday? Or do you want me to like make a big deal out of it? She said, oh, you better make a big deal. Out of it. Okay, I got it, got it. So um, she, she was a teacher, and at the time she was teaching Spanish, had been teaching Spanish for some time. She had been a Spanish major at university, but she'd never been to Spain. Her birthday happened to fall on a weekend that we had a three-day weekend. It was a Monday holiday. Her birthday was going to be Saturday. Now, I also need to say, as I'm telling you this, you're going to think, oh, he is such a wonderful husband that he did that for her birthday. Yesterday was her birthday, and I was here, so I, I, I don't always get it right, okay? Because after I stepped at this whole thing, she said, you'll be away on my birthday. It's not a zero birthday, so I'm okay. So anyway, I said, okay, I started to figure this out. I said, here's what I'm going to do. On Thursday, I'm going to show up at school. I'm going to get her out of school. I arranged for a substitute teacher for her. Uh, I packed for her. Hey, hey, hey. It's okay. We were going to Madrid. It's her birthday. If I forgot anything, we'll go buy it. Happy birthday, honey. You know, but I noticed, you know, that morning I noticed she, she had a skirt that was a khaki colored skirt. So I grabbed her khaki slacks. You know, so I'm thinking I show up to her classroom. She immediately thinks what happened to one of our sons? You know, I said, no, nothing. It's okay. Come on. We're, we're taking a little trip. We get to the car. We're heading to the airport. She has no idea where we're going. I had put together a three ring binder with all the top 10 things to do in Spain that was in the back seat. And I'm making her guess what's happening, where we're going. And when she finally guessed, I gave her the notebook and, you know, going through all that stuff. We go to Spain. You know, we had three wonderful days. It was amazing. You know, came back home and, and God was really in this thing. Uh, because on our flight back home, as we're checking in at Madrid, we got upgraded to first class. Yes, honey, I arranged that. Uh, Now, here's the thing. Did I already love her? Absolutely. But you know what I experienced in doing all that? With every little thing I did, I loved her more and wanted to do something more. That's what God does when we actually begin to put into practice, when we take our bodies and do the things that our mind knows we should do, that he works in us spiritually to develop then. Habits of grace work the same way. You know you're supposed to be reading scripture and meditating on it, but you don't always feel like it. You know, maybe you started a through, one year through the Bible reading program on January 1st, and you're already four days behind. That's okay. You know, you'll catch up eventually, and it's no big deal. But as you continue to do that, God will shape you. And eventually, you'll get to the place where, you, oh, yeah, it's just automatic. You're just going to do it. It becomes a habit, and God's grace comes through that. Or as you pray, or as you journal, or you fast, or whatever it might be. And, and, and these habits are numerous, You know, giving financially is a habit of grace. It's hard to do at first and be sacrificial, but God does something in us and through us when we continue to do that. 
Serving people who you don't like is a habit of grace because, yeah, you'll be serving them, but you're the one that's going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind and changed and made into somebody more like Jesus. But it takes practice. It's not inauthentic. It's not hypocritical to do it when you don't feel like it. It's amazing to me that, that, that it's habits of grace that seems to be the only area that we say, oh, no, I can't do that. That's not authentic. I'm not feeling it right now. In every other area of life, we do things to develop habits even when we don't feel like it. How many of you learned to play a musical instrument along the way? How many of you got good at it? Okay, you're the ones that kept practicing the habits of grace along the way. (laughs) And it's true with so many other things. Again, quoting from James K.A. Smith, he says this, virtue formation takes practice And there's no practice that isn't repetitive. We willingly embrace repetition in all kinds of other sectors of life to hone our golf swing, our piano prowess, and our mathematical abilities, for example. If the sovereign Lord has created us as creatures of habit, why should we think that repetition is inimical to our spiritual growth? If you want to grow spiritually, keep doing the same things over and over till they become habit. And God works through those to shape you and change you. It's one of the reasons, I think, why historically liturgy is such a big deal within the church. And when I say liturgy, I don't mean, okay, high church Anglicanism. You know, I just, like whatever it is that is the thing we consistently do, you have a liturgy here. Interestingly, it's not much different from the liturgy we have at our church in Florida. There's a couple of songs, there's some announcements, you greet one another, you pray, there's the table, there's the word, and you do that again and again and again. And it doesn't have to be the biggest, flashiest, most exciting thing going on. I mean, it's hard to imagine that you're actually able to lead people to Jesus here without moving lights and fog machines. <laughs> but you can, because you just consistently do the stuff that Jesus calls you to do. It becomes a habit that can be new every morning because the Lord's there and he's in it if we're open to what he's doing. The Lord promises to meet us in our habits and he infuses them with his grace, with his presence. And what ends up happening is you learn to love those things and love him more over time. And you will become what you love. You'll become like Jesus, because of those habits filled with grace, those ongoing practices that lead you more and more into your relationship with Jesus. And it really is about becoming like Jesus. Who are you? You are Christ's own. You are his hands and feet in the world. And we can say, oh yes, I love Jesus, but find that we're actually being conformed and shaped and fashioned into what the world says we should love because that's the habits we live with. So if we change those habits, even just start with one. Say, you know what? I, my prayer, I need to pray more. I need to figure out how to pray. Well, force yourself to. <laughs> just like you forced yourself to learn how to swing a golf club or play the piano or do maths. And eventually what happens is it just becomes a part of you and you yearn for it more and you learn to love Jesus more. Now, what's the point of doing these things in terms of our relationship with Jesus? It's not to earn anything. And that's sort of the problem I have with spiritual disciplines. It sounds like me doing this stuff so Jesus will say, oh yes, you're welcome now. You know, come and be a part of me. No, it is doing things that allows Jesus to shape us. And it's doing those things because you already know that he loves you. You know, what does, what does John say? We love him because he first loved us. So you're doing things in response to Jesus, not to get Jesus to do something for you. It's in response to the love that you know he already has for you. He demonstrated that love on the cross, ultimately. Ultimately. And he continues to say, come to me. Come to me with all you are, all your brokenness, everything going on in your life, 
and just day by day, one foot after another, do the ordinary things of praying, of reading, of serving, of giving, and see if through those habits of grace, God doesn't shape your character so that you get to the place where you just want to and yearn to do the things that God loves. And they become the things that you love. That's a whole lifelong process to be sure. But it's a response to the good news, to the gospel, to the grace that God has given us. And that will shape your behavior and your character, your personal life, Monday through Saturday. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, it is at times difficult to discipline ourselves to do the things we know we need to do. But Father, I pray that you would remind each one of us of your incredible love and we would respond to that love, that that's what would drive us, that's what would guide us, that's what would would pull and tug at us to be more consistent in our habits with you and that those habits would shape our character, that it would transform who we are, that our our thinking would change because our relationship with you changes, that we get to know you more deeply in those habits and we get to know ourselves as you shape us through those habits. And we pray that all of that would be a light and a witness to the people around us of the joy and the delight that comes from following Jesus. We pray that it would be your kingdom that we experience and that people see and are drawn to and that they come to faith in Christ because you've made us more like yourself. In your name we pray, amen.